if you're not standing, if you can stand with us as we'll have our confession of faith, amen. Hallelujah. Grab your Bible, your smart device, whatever holds your word, and we'll make our confession together because at this church we believe the Bible when it says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, hold it up high. Repeat after me. Say, this is the word of God. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I can be who it says I can be. I will be taught the word of God. So I boldly confess mind is alert, my heart is receptive, for I'm about to receive the incorruptible, the indestructible, the ever-living seed of the Word of God. This is my hour for a life-changing touch from God. I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. Come on, give the Lord high praise in the sanctuary. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, saints of God, if you'll turn in your Bibles to the book of Zechariah, the fourth chapter and the sixth verse. This is our foundational text for this series of lessons. Amen. Zechariah 4 and 6. We're in this series of lessons called Living in God's Reality. Amen. Hallelujah. Living in God's Reality. And uh, we're, we've been saying that li living in God's reality is life in the supernatural. Everyone say supernatural. Yes, yeah, life in the supernatural. Amen. In Zechariah 4 and 6, Zechariah sees a lampstand with seven candles on top of it, with seven pipes flowing to that those seven uh, uh, candlesticks. And, and he sees a bowl sitting on top of the lampstand and two olive trees that have grown up beside it. And the olive trees are dripping olive uh, oil into the bowl. And he sees this image and he asks the angel, what, what does this mean? And the angel begins to explain it to him in Zechariah 4 and 6. And the word of the Lord says, then he said to me, this continuous supply of oil is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, prince of Judah, saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit of whom the oil is a symbol, says the Lord of hosts. Everyone said, not by might nor by power, but by his spirit. Amen. And so we went over to Isaiah, the 11th chapter, Isaiah 11. Praise the Lord. Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 2. As, as the Lord told us that this was not done by might or power, but it will be done and accomplished by his spirit. The assignments, the purposes in life. Amen. The challenges that we need to overcome will be overcome by his spirit. Hallelujah. And so we went over to Isaiah 11 verses 1 and 2. Take a look and see what this uh, this spirit, what the spirit of God is supposed to do in our life. And then uh, we saw this in verses 1 and 2 of where the word of the Lord says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Now let's go over to Proverbs 1 and 7. Proverbs 1 and 7, we'll read out the Amplified Bible, and this is going to guide our thinking uh, as uh, our focus, uh, as we uh, focus on our, our topic for today. Amen. Proverbs 1 and 7. Amen. And then let's read this section together, saints of God. Ready? Read. The reverent fear of the Lord, that is, worshiping Him and regarding Him as truly awesome, is the beginning and the preeminent part of knowledge, its starting point and its essence. But arrogant fools despise skillful and godly wisdom and instruction and self-discipline. I want to use for a title today's lesson, saints of God, I will glorify God. Hallelujah. I will glorify God. Amen. Will you bow your heads in a moment of prayer with me? Father, in Jesus' name, we do magnify you and thank you, Lord God, for your grace and mercy. And we thank you for this time circled together around your word. I thank you for every believer that falls under the sound of my voice, for those who've logged on to watch us streaming live, and even for those that will come into contact with this teaching at a later date. Father, we thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. And we pray that you will manifest yourself as the teacher, causing the complex to be made simple. And since you know us name by name and situation by situation, I ask that you tailor this lesson to meet each of us right where we are, bringing forth an incredible and amazing harvest of revelation, of insight, 
harvest of deliverance and recovery, a harvest of elevation and prosperity. God, we thank you and we declare that our lives will never be the same after we receive your word today. In Jesus' name, let everyone say amen. All right, saints of God. Well, uh, we've been here now. We've been here as uh, we looked at this series of lessons called God's Reality. And one of the things that we noted over the last several weeks is that without the sevenfold uh, spirits of God operating in our lives, we will succumb to our natural limitations. And we went on to define these seven flows, amen, to uh, help us to understand the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit comes into our lives uh, to do. And we noted, saints of God, in these seven flows that there was the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, it says in Isaiah 11 and 2. Rest upon us is the presence of God, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of uh, wisdom is uh, has to do, saints of God, with more than just the right application of the knowledge I have, but it has to do with the creative ability, creative genius of the Holy Spirit operating in my life. And then there was the spirit of understanding. And this is knowing how two and two fit together, how the things and the principles of the kingdom work with one another and how all things in the kingdom fit together. And then there was the spirit of counsel. This is the, the advice, the advisement of God, the counsel of God. Hallelujah, the plan and the purposes of God. The multiple plans of God fitting into a scheme in our life. And then there was the might of God, which had to do with the supernatural power of God that is available to every born again. Again, believer. And then there was the spirit of knowledge, hallelujah, the spirit of knowledge. And this went beyond just information. It went beyond just learning. Uh, but, uh, but it really had to do with what we call yada. It had to do with intimate knowledge and intimate relationship, intimate knowing of God. And then we went on to talk about the spirit, the spirit of the fear of the Lord, hallelujah. And that's where we are today, saints of God. And we said that the spirit of the fear of the Lord is not a, uh, us cowering down in fear for fear of God, punishing us, beating us, hurting us, uh, uh, afflicting plagues on us or something of that nature. But this really had to do with this reverential fear and this uh, the despising of wanting to hurt God's heart. Amen. And so we're talking about honor and worship. We're talking about reverencing God and holding God in high esteem. Amen. Well, we went on, saints of God, and I gave you the objective, and I'll share that again with you uh, now as I review for the next few moments before we dive into our focus today. And we said that the objective of this series of lessons is to train and educate the believer on the method by which God transforms the Christian's life, encouraging the believer to trust and be transformed by the principles, the power, and the person of the Holy Spirit. By the principles, the power, and the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, last week, we used, uh, we used for a title of last week's lesson, hallelujah, we said, open your eyes and see the Lord. Open your eyes and see the Lord. And we noted from Luke, the fifth chapter, saints of God, verses 1 through 10, that there Jesus Christ now is being thronged and he's being followed by uh, thousands of people there. And he, as he's walking by the sea, he sees two fishing boats that are sitting idle on the seashore. He climbs into Peter's boat and he asks Peter to thrust out just a little bit so that he can teach the people. And Peter did so, and after Jesus had finished speaking and preaching, he then told Peter to go out into the deep and let down his nets that he might catch a drought or a haul of fish. The Bible says that when Peter, uh, when Jesus said that to Peter, Peter responded to him and said, Lord, you know, we fished all night. We've toiled all night. We've worked at this all night. We've caught nothing, but nevertheless, at thy word, we will let down our net. The Bible says that Peter lets down his net, saints of God, and then his boat, began, his nets were filled uh, with uh, many fish. In verses uh, 6 through 8, Luke 5, verses 6 through 8, it says, when, And when they had done this, when they let down their nets, they caught a great number of fish. And their nets were at the point of breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled the boat, uh, filled both of the boats uh, with fish so that they began to sink. But when Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, go, go away from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. The Bible says that when Peter saw him, hallelujah, that he fell down. I want you to know, saints of God, that amazing things begin to happen when you finally see it, hallelujah. 
when you finally see it, Peter loses the will and the desire to stand before Christ and speak to him as a man, as, 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 uh, speak to him as a man, uh, uh, as a man, but he realizes uh, who he is. He realizes who Jesus is, is and he refuses now to talk to him face to face as a man. Peter is gripped with reverential fear at the revelation of his person, his position, his power, and his prowess. Peter comes to the realization of who Jesus is and he realizes that Jesus is in my boat. Hallelujah. The Lord God is in my boat. Amen. And he no longer uh, feels comfortable talking to Jesus face to face as a man speaks to another man. But he abases himself and he falls down. Peter is gripped with reverential fear. Peter no longer wants to stand, but he abases himself before Jesus and surrendered his will and life to the Lord. Why? Because Peter can finally see it. I want you to know, saints of God, that when you finally see it, that you will want to honor God in the same way. He can see who he really is. He, he is it is beyond his, his historical documentation of Jesus' resume. It goes beyond the preaching and the teaching as a prophet of God, beyond the crowds that follow and the popularity of Jesus. Peter can see through the distractions and his own cloudy understanding and he realizes that he is in the presence of God. Peter falls down on his knees as if to worship the Lord. And I'm saying to you, saints of God, that when you finally see it, when you come into the realization of who Jesus really is in your life, hallelujah, that you'll fall down. You'll lose that, that sense of, of a, a, a complacency that sometimes we have because we become so familiar with God, so familiar with worship, so familiar with praise, so familiar with church attendance that we come in and we're distracted by so many things. We're looking around to see who's wearing what and who's doing what. And and we forget that we're supposed to be worshiping and honoring and focusing on God. But well, we've come become complacent, hallelujah. But Peter now, at the realization of who Jesus is, he says he's not just a prophet. He's not just a man. He's, ju he's not just a mentor. He's not just a rabbi. But he is God in the flesh and he falls down to worship him. You see, when you finally get it, nobody will have to say, put your hands together and give God a hand clap of praise. They won't have to say, lift up your voices and bless the Lord. They won't say, have to say, give God a wave offering. They won't have to say, bow down. You'll just start doing it at the thought of how good God has been to you. Hallelujah. The realization changes Peter's life. And I'm telling you that this revelation will also change your life. When you can see it, when you finally come to the place where you see the glory and see who God really is in your life, you'll be gripped with reverential fear. I will glorify God. I will glorify God, part three. Hallelujah. I want to give you four simple things, saints of God, that happen when you possess the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Number one, saints of God, when you possess the spirit of the fear of the Lord, it equips you for victorious living. Uh, you will endure victory. You will overcome obstacles. You will endure storms. You will work your way through the darkness. Hallelujah. And you will be victorious when you operate with the spirit of the fear of the Lord operating in your life. When you have the spirit of the fear of the Lord, it enables you to overcome temptation. That's when you say, you know what? I don't want to do this thing because I do not want to dishonor God. I don't want to break God's heart. Hallelujah. When you have the spirit of the fear of the Lord, you despise the displeasure of the Lord. And then, saints of God, when you possess the spirit of the fear of the Lord, you begin to envision victory and promise. Hallelujah. I'm able to see beyond the trial or the challenge. I can see beyond the difficulty and the pain. I can see beyond the storm. I can see beyond the mountain. I can see beyond the darkness. I can see beyond the valley when I have the spirit of the fear of the Lord operating in my life. This is when God said to Abraham, he says, stand upon the mountain and look from where you are to the place that I'm going to give you. Glory to God. When you have the spirit of the fear of the Lord living in your life, I'm telling you, saints of God, that you can look beyond the trial. You can see beyond the difficulty. You can see beyond the challenge. And you can see the promise that God has made you in your life. 
When you have the spirit of the fear of the Lord, hallelujah, operating in your life, it energizes my walk through the storm. I can make it through the valley. Hallelujah. I want you to know, saints of God, several things here that I'm going to share as we wrap up this lesson on the, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Hallelujah. Number one is that God demands reverential fear. He demands honor and praise and worship from those who are saved and called by him. It's not a request, but it is a demand. The Bible says in Isaiah 49 and 3 in the Amplified Bible, and the Lord, and the Lord said to me, you are my servant servant Israel in whom I will show my glory. Hallelujah. God speaks to them and the word Israel means contender. It means to have power with God. And he says, those of you who are my children, you have power with me and you are my servants. Hallelujah. You are my chosen vessels. You are the ones that worship me. You are the ones that carry out my will. You are the ones that carry out my wishes. You are the one that bow and worship me. Hallelujah. God is saying here that when you are connected with me, that I command you to honor me. I command you to obey me. I command you to worship and serve me. The second thing, saints of God, when we have the fear of the Lord is that I want you to understand the fear of the Lord must be taught. Hallelujah. It must be taught and learned. You do not automatically come into your relationship with God knowing the spirit of the fear of the Lord. It has to be taught. It must be learned. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 31 and 12 in the Amplified Bible, the Bible says, assemble the people. Hallelujah. Everyone say, let's get together. The word says, assemble the people, the men and the women and the children and the stranger, the resident alien or the foreigner. Listen to what God says. He says, I want you to get all the men together and then I want you to get all the women together and watch this and don't leave your children at home. Get your children together also. And I want you to go and get the stranger. That's right. The foreigner, the ones who don't even know me, assemble them and bring them together as well. Hallelujah. This is the assignment that God gives every born-again believer. Many times, saints of God, we don't carry out our assignment, but I want you to know that God has saved you with purpose. Yes, he created you and made you with purpose, but he also saved you with purpose. Hallelujah. That God wants to use you to speak to other people. He wants to use you to encourage others. He wants to use you to be an example to others. God says, go get the ones, even the ones that don't even know me. Bring them into a relationship with me. That's part of our assignment here. Watch this now. He says the men, get the men, get the women, and get the children, and then get the stranger, the resident for alien and the foreigner within your city. He says within your influence, those that you have access to, within your cubicle, within your department at work, within your sphere of influence at the gym, within the people that you hang out with, he says go get them. Watch this, watch this so that they may hear and learn and fear the Lord your God. This is a learned behavior. Watch this. Fear God with all field reverence and profound respect and be careful to obey all the words of this law. God says that this has to be taught. Parents, he's telling us to get the men, the women, and the children because this is something that we have to pass along to our children. Hallelujah. This is our primary responsibility. Amen. And this is important, saints of God, because in many cases we'll take our children and then we'll send them to school and we'll expect the teachers to teach them everything. No, that's our job. Hallelujah. Yes, they're going to teach them math, English, science, and social studies. I understand all of those things. What I'm talking about is that we are the ones who are responsible for raising our children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. God says that we ought to raise up our children and train them in the way that they should go. And when they are older, hallelujah, they will not, they will not go away from it. That is our responsibility. I don't need a stranger to teach my child. That's my responsibility. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 
this principle, thanks of God, this principle of success, the principles of success and victory is established in the word of God. God teaches us how to succeed. He teaches us how to win. If someone says, well, pastor, I've endured failure after failure after failure, my life, my life, my life, I can tell you that you have not been applying the principles of the word of God. But if you do, you may have been experienced failure in your past. I'm telling you that those failures are going to start turning into victories. Hallelujah. Your testimony is going to change. Glory to God. You're going to move from a place of sorrow to a place of celebration. You're going to say, never before in my life have I endured such victory. Have I experienced such joy and peace? The principles of success and victory is established in the word of God in Hebrews, the sixth chapter and the twelfth verse. The word of the Lord says, so that you will not be spiritually sluggish. This tells us that we have a tendency of becoming sluggish. He says, I don't want you to be spiritually sluggish. And he's talking, thanks of God, to the church. He's not talking to the world. But he says that you will not be spiritually sluggish, but will instead be imitators of those who through faith lean on with absolute trust and confidence in him and in his power. You need to be of those that lean on God, that trust in his absolute power. Hallelujah. Watch what it says here. It says, and by patience, patient endurance, even with suffering. See, our problem is that we don't want to go through anything. See, we don't want to go through anything, but God says that, that, that we will go through some things, but he says that imitate those who went through the same thing and came out victorious now. The Bible says that in this life you will have tribulation. There will be turbulence in your life. Yeah, your relationship may not be the way that you wanted it to be. Hallelujah. Your children may not be acting the way that you wanted them to be. And your finances may not be, your pocketbook may not be the way that you want it. You may not have as much cheese as you wanted to have. Praise the Lord. But God says in this life you'll have tribulation. Watch this. But be of good cheer, Jesus says, for I have overcome the world. And if he has overcome the world and he lives inside of you, then you too are an overcomer. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He says now, he says by patient endurance, even when suffering are now inheriting the promises of God. See, you inherit the promises when you stay the course. You inherit the promises when you apply the principles. You inherit the promises when you honor and reverently fear God. And many of us get real upset when we find out that people are talking about us. Oh, they talking about me, Pastor. They dogging me out, this person, and people I never thought would talk about me. They doing me wrong, and I'm, I'm enduring so much persecution. Well, I want you to know that Jesus Christ said that the hundredfold return comes with persecution. Hallelujah. Just to, and, and if they've been talking about you, persecution is also people talking about you and dogging you out. If they're talking about you and dogging you out, that means your blessing is on the way. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Your hundredfold is on the way. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Deacon, I'm a little warm back here. Somebody, I see people fainting. People fainting, y'all warm? I'm feeling warm. Glory to God. And it's not just the Holy Ghost fire. Praise the Lord. Jesus and the Spirit functions by the same principle. This is real good for us to understand because the Bible says the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. And I want you to see that when we look at these manifestations of God, we see that Jesus and the Holy Spirit now function by the same principles that God is teaching us to function by now. We see this, saints of God, they both reverently fear and honor the Father. Watch this now. Uh, in John, the 16th chapter, verses 13 through 15, John 16, verses 13 through 15, we find this, saints of God. The Bible says in the Amplified Bible, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, full and complete truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative. Watch this now. But he will speak whatever he hears from the Father, the, the message regarding the Son. Now look at him now because that he is not going to say whatever he just wants to say, but he's going to receive instructions from the Father on what to say. Hallelujah. He's going to do what God instructs him to do. Look at this now. And he will disclose to you what is to come in the future. This is really, really, really important because Jesus even said, I do not speak on my own. I don't say what I want to say, but I say what the Father tells me to say. And he says the Holy Spirit does the exact same thing. So if the, if, the, if the Son and the Holy Spirit are doing this, then how much more so you and I? 
We need to reverently fear God and then honor God and live life by his principles. I can tell you that if you apply the principles of the word of God to your life, then your life is going to change. Hallelujah. Look at verse 14. It says, he will glorify and honor me. There it is. They're talking about glory and honor. The Holy Spirit, Jesus says, is going to glorify and honor me because he, the Holy Spirit, will take from what is mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine because of this. I said that he, the Spirit, will take from what is mine and will reveal it to you. In other words, what he's saying is Jesus now, he is God in the flesh. Now what the Bible says, hallelujah, is that he came down, he put on sinful flesh that he might live among the saints of God and become the propitiation, the payment, the, the sacrifice for our sin. Watch this. He takes off his, his crown of, of eternal glory and he sits it aside in order to put on sinful flesh now to come down and live and live amongst us watch this now the Bible says that the Holy Spirit takes of God what what God has is the same thing that Jesus has he takes of it and the Bible says he will transmit it and disclose it and transfer it over to us he does this by his words glory to God so when we allow the words of God hallelujah to govern our life the resources of heaven that is being released in our life are released by the words of God that way, saints of God, he says that his word will not return unto him void. Isaiah 55, he's telling us that it will accomplish what he sent it to do. If we will allow God and reverence God and honestly lean upon him and trust him, God will do all that he promised to do in our lives. Hallelujah. Look at this now. Oh, this is good. This is good. If you want to glorify God, simply fear him. If you want to glorify God, just fear him. Reverent fear of God leads to glorifying him. When we reverently fear God, it leads us to a place where we glorify him. Look at this in the book of Psalms. Go over to Psalms 22. Psalms 22. Hallelujah. Psalms 22, verses 22 through 23. Watch what he says. I will tell of your name to my countrymen. David says, I'm going to tell everybody of your goodness. Let me tell everybody of how awesome and amazing you are. And this is what we are to do, saints of God. We are to share our testimony. Many of us don't tell about how good God is. But David says, I'm going to tell it to the countrymen. Notice, he didn't say I was going to tell them at church. He's got something else going on at church. He said, I didn't say I was going to tell them at church only. I'm going to tell it to my countrymen. I'm going to tell it to everybody I come into contact with. How good you are, God. How amazing you are. How powerful you are, God. How strong you are, God. How faithful you are, God. How long-suffering you are. How loving, kind you are, God. Saints of God, the Lord wants you to share your testimony, not just with your church brother or with your church sister. He wants you to tell everybody how good he is, how amazing he's been to you. Hallelujah. Somebody shout, share your testimony. He says, I will tell, I will tell of your name to my countrymen. Watch this. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. He says, when I get to church, I'm not going to spend my time looking around at everybody. I'm not going to spend my time being distracted. God, I'm going to bless you. God, I'm going to praise you. I'm going to begin to declare how awesome you are. I'm going to begin to thank you and honor you and bless you because of how far you've brought me. I Listen, I know you may not be where you want to be. Hallelujah. I know you may not have accomplished all that you want to accomplish. I know you may not have achieved every goal that you had in mind. But all of us can honestly say, I'm not where I used to be. God has brought me a mighty long way. David says, I will praise you, God, in the midst, watch this, in the midst of the congregation, watch this. When I get amongst my own brethren, I'll throw my hands up. I'll bless your name. I'll worship you, God. I'll honor you, Lord. I'll bow down and reverence you, Lord. I'll sing a song to you, God. I'll speak in tongues before you, almighty God. I'll honor you with everything that I have, oh great God. I'll bring my tithe and my offering. I'll bring my service unto you. I'll bring my worship unto you. I'll do everything before you, almighty God, because you are worthy of praise. You're worthy of worship. You're worthy of honor. Sometimes we come to church and we spend so much time looking around. Tell, tell your neighbor, I ain't got time to be distracted by you today, not today. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Not today, not today, not today. No, not today. Hallelujah. 
I got the focus when you enter into the place of the congregation we worship. We do this at home, but I'm just specifically talking about when we come here. We glorify God. We worship God. We give God everything that we are. Hallelujah. Glory be unto God. Look at this, saints of God. He says, I will tell of your name to my countrymen in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You, watch now. Now he's talking to us. Watch now. You who fear the Lord with all inspired reverence, praise him. Hallelujah. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Fear him with submissive wonder, all you descendants of Israel. Oh, this is real good. He calls us Jacob and then he calls us Israel. Jacob, the word Jacob, his name means trickster. It means conniver. It's a, he's a, it represents a liar, saints of God, a manipulator. So he's saying to us, saints of God, that there's two sides of you. Before you were born again, there's that trickster. Oh, come on, somebody. Y'all looking at me like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Hallelujah. He says, yeah, 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 there's that side and then there's the born again promised side. Yeah, there's the Israelite side of you. I want your whole being to worship God. Go over to God. You bring everything that you are. Well, pastor, I don't have it all together. Bring your untogether self before the Lord and worship him. Hallelujah. When your flesh don't feel like getting up, get up anyway. When your flesh don't feel like worshiping, worship anyway. When your flesh don't feel like praising, praise God anyhow. Hallelujah. He says, yeah, bring your whole self, bring your whole self into my presence and worship and glorify the Most High God. The fear of the Lord, saints of God, the fear of God increases belief and ensure assurance. When we fear God, there is an increase. There is an increase of belief and there's an increase of assurance. I'm sure that God's on my side. Look in your Bibles at Proverbs, Proverbs, the 14th chapter. Go to Proverbs 14 and 26. Proverbs 14 and 26. Hallelujah. Proverbs 14 and 26. Glory to God. Glory to God. Look at this, saints of God. 14 and 26 in the Amplified Bible. It says, it says, in the reverent fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence. When I have reverential fear of God, man, I got strong confidence. When the spirit of the fear of the Lord, saints of God, is operating in my life, I have strong confidence. Look what he's saying. There is strong confidence and his children will always have a place of refuge. Oh my God. So when I'm in possession of the spirit of the fear of the Lord, there's something happening now. Not only am I having strong confidence in God, but the people of God, the children, the people who fear God this way will always have a place of refuge. Let me give you this definition of refuge, saints of God, so you'll know what he's talking about. Refuge is a condition of being safe. It is a condition of being safe or sheltered from pursuit, danger, or trouble. Then even when I'm going through difficult times, I have a refuge. When I have strong confidence in the fear of God, I have a refuge, a condition of being safe. God's going to make me safe. Hallelujah. He's going to make me safe. God is going to halt the pursuit of the enemy. He's going to stop the pursuit. Hallelujah. Of difficulty in my life. I have a place of refuge, but I must have confidence. And when I have the knowledge of the spirit of the fear of the Lord, saints of God, I operate in confidence. I don't know what you're going through, but I'm telling you that God's going to work it out. Hallelujah. I don't know what's happening in your life right now, but I'm telling you, God's going to turn it around. If you are a believer in God, you need to have confidence in him. And God, saints of God, will open the door and make a way for your refuge. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He's going to take care of you. And you have to understand, saints of God, that you are the example. You are an example to others. Do you know that others are looking at you? You are an example to others. When you follow God and do good, it causes others to see your good, to glorify, praise and honor and reverently fear God. You are the example. Many of you are the only Jesus that people have ever seen because you call yourself Christian. They say, okay, well, let me look at you and see what Jesus is like. 
Let me see how you deal with difficulty. Let me see how you deal with disappointment. Let me see how you deal with pain, heartache, and anguish. Let me see how you deal with the storm. Let me see how you deal with haters. Let me see how you deal with your enemies. Let me see how you deal with persecution. Let me watch you because in watching you, they will get to know Jesus. Hallelujah. Look at this in Matthew, the fifth chapter and the 16th verse. Matthew 16 and 20 and Matthew 5 and 16 the Bible says let your light shine before men let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good deeds and moral excellence and recognize and honor and glorify your father who is in heaven this is real important for us to understand that he says let your light shine before men Hallelujah. Watch this, that they may see your good deeds, not see you. They need to see your what? Good deeds. You don't have to point out to them, look how good I'm being. Look how awesome I am. Look what I'm doing. Can't you see that I'm doing good? I helped sister so-and-so and I helped brother so-and-so. He couldn't take care of his rent and I gave him a few hundred dollars to help him. No, 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 no. That's drawing attention to you. He says, let them see your good works. All you've got to do is do good and let them see your moral excellence. When they see you doing good they will give glory to God it's not supposed to glorify you that's what you're doing when you're focusing attention on yourself it's supposed to focus attention on God the more good you do the more glory God gets do you notice that the more good we do the more glory God gets the more we forgive the more glory God gets the more we love the more glory God gets the more we serve the more glory God gets the more we help the more glory God gets Hallelujah. You are the example. He says, let your light shine. Not you. Let your light shine so that men will see your good works. Men need to see you doing good. They have to see it. I tell you, God knows us. He knows our fall, fall, uh, short fallings. He knows our frailties. We need to see people doing good. If you watch Satan, Satan has an agenda. He has an agenda. When you watch the news, they don't want to put too much news about people doing good. Think about it. It's always about what people are doing bad. And in some cases, they glorify them. Huh? Because the enemy has an agenda to keep your mind clouded and to keep people thinking that there's no good in the world, that there's no light shining in the darkness. Hallelujah. But there is. God says, let your light shine. And I'm telling you, saints of God, the more light that is shining, the more darkness that is dispelled. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory be unto God. When we start shining our light, saints of God, I'm telling you, the darkness has to retreat. Have you noticed that when you turn off the light, the room fills with darkness? But when you turn on the light, darkness has to retreat. It's got to move. It's got to be dispelled. It's got to go. And as we shine our light, as we do good, as we serve one another, as we honor God, as we are a blessing to one another, I'm telling you that darkness will have to dispel. Darkness will have to go. Hallelujah. And we will begin to endure victory as we do things God's way. Hallelujah. One of the purposes, saints of God, of miracles is to bring people to a place of reverential fear. One of the reasons why God functions and gave us miracles, not just not only because we need them, hallelujah, not only because his power is just miraculous to us, to God it's every day. Not only those reasons, but the other reasons is to bring people into the reverential fear of the Lord. God wants to do amazing things in your life so that other people will come to know him. He wants to do amazing things in their life as well. In the book of John, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 4, and then verses 45 through 48, the Bible here, sakes of God, says that a man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and, his, and her sister Martha. This was the same Mary who massaged the Lord's feet with aromatic oils and, and then wiped them with her hair. It was her brother, Lazarus, who was sick. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Master, the one who you love so very much is sick. When Jesus got the message, he said, this sickness is not fatal. It will become an occasion to show glory, to show God's glory by glorifying the Son. He says this sickness is not 
unto death, but it will become an occasion for God to get glory. I don't know what you're going through today, saints of God. I don't know what trouble you're facing. I don't know what storm you're in. I don't know what attack that you've been under, but I want you to know that this is not unto death, but this is an occasion for God to get glory. Hallelujah. It is an occasion for God to get glory. And as you walk through the storm, as you confront the, the situation, as you bring confrontation to the mountain, as you traverse the valley, as you walk through the darkness, as you keep walking through the storm, I'm telling you that God is going to get glory. God is going to be glorified as he elevates you, as he lifts you up, as he magnifies you, as he delivers you. I'm telling you, God is going to get glory out of this situation. It's an opportunity and an occasion for God to show up and show out. Hallelujah. Somebody say, let him get glory. Let him get glory. He's going to show up and do amazing things in your life. God is going to do amazing things in your life. And what we need to have is what I read earlier, confidence. Yes. They that have the spirit of the fear of the Lord have, have real confidence in God. Yes. We can trust God. God knows what he's doing. Yes. It doesn't always feel good, but God knows what he's doing. You may not always be able to see the end, but God knows what he's doing. You may not be sure of how he's going to do it, but God knows what he's doing. I know it doesn't feel like you're winning. It might feel like you're losing, but God knows what he's doing. That's why he said we need to walk by faith and not by sight, because when we do things God's way, you're going to win every time. Hallelujah. In verse 45 through 48 in the Message Bible, the Bible says, that was the turnaround. Here it is. That's the turnaround. That was the turnaround for many of the Jews who were with Mary. They saw what Jesus did. You see, some people have got to see it. They got to see you. See, see, see. Sometimes God needs to allow for you to walk through the storm. No, 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 no. Because why? Why? Because sometimes somebody's got to see it. They got to see it. Some people just won't believe until they see somebody go through it. When they see somebody who made it through after everybody left them. When they see somebody who made it through when they ran out of money. When they see somebody who made it through it when their house got repossessed and their car got foreclosed on. When they did that, they said, oh, but somebody, somebody's got to see somebody overcome cancer. Somebody's got to see somebody overcome a situation. Sometimes they got to see it. The Bible says that when they saw it, see, God says that you, you, you are the one that's going to make it through. I know you're saying, yeah, but they didn't make it. That's all right. But you will. Hallelujah. He's got to see somebody. Somebody's got to see somebody being elevated. Somebody that trusted God. Somebody whose life came back together after it fell apart when they trusted. Glory to God. Yeah, he says that's you. You are the world's example. You are the world's example. Hallelujah. You're the world's example. Glory be unto God. He says that was the turnaround for many of the Jews who were with Mary. They saw what Jesus did and believed in him. But some went back to the Pharisees and told on Jesus... The high priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Jewish ruling body. What do we do now? <laughs> I want you to understand, saints of God, that when you start reverently fearing God and serving God in this manner, there'll be so amazed, so many amazing things happening that your haters are going to call a meeting. <laughs> They're going to get together and say, girl, what do we do now? Hallelujah. Glory to God. What in the world are we going to do now? Hallelujah. What do we do now, they ask. This man keeps on doing things, creating God signs. Hallelujah. Everywhere you go, I declare there's going to be a God sign. Amen. People are going to start experiencing signs, miracles, and wonders and seeing the miraculous things that God is doing in your life. It's going to be a God sign pointing glory to the Most High God. Hallelujah. Ah, these God signs, watch what they said. They says, if, if we let him go on, pretty soon everyone will be believing in him. See, all you've got to do is just keep going. 
I know it's hard. Oh, man, I know you came in. You may have come in here heavy. You may have come in here with tears in your eye. You may have come in here on your last leg. But I'm telling you, you just keep going on. Hallelujah. You just keep walking. You just keep pressing forward. You keep believing. You keep having confidence in God. Hallelujah. God's going to do amazing things in your life. I'm telling you, you're creating you. You are creating a God sign. And you'll be able to testify, God, turn that whole thing around. Glory to God. Yes, he did. He turned it around. He said, if he keeps going like this, people are going to keep believing. See, if you just keep going, people are going to start believing. They're going to start believing if you just keep walking. Glory to God. He said, then they go on to say, and the Romans will come and remove the little power and the privilege we still have. In the book of Joshua, it's important, saints of God, that we teach because it's our responsibility. He says, get the men, the women, and the children, and the foreigners we have to teach. It's our responsibility to teach. It's not just your pastor's calling. It's every born-again believer's calling. Every Christian's calling. He told us to go into all the world, all the earth, and teach and preach the gospel to share the good news. It is our responsibility to be an example, to carry the truth, to carry the soup, not just the truth, watch this now, not just the truth of the gospel, but also the power and the demonstration of God's spirit and presence being with you. That's why it's important for us to pray. That's why it's important for us to lay hands. That's why it's important for us to call things out. Hallelujah. Instead of looking at situations and talking about how bad it is, we need to look at the situation and call those things that be not as though they were. Hallelujah. I declare peace in this house in the name of Jesus. I declare peace in this house in the name of Jesus. Things going on in your home, I declare peace in this house in the name of Jesus. Yeah, you take authority. Hallelujah. In Joshua, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 3, verses 6 and 7, and verses 20 through 24. I'm going to read these to you, saints of God. Now watch this. The Bible says, so it was when all the nations, or when all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, he's taking the children of Israel across the Jordan out of the wilderness into the promised land. They are walking out of pain into promise. Walking out of pain into promise. And the Bible says, after everyone had passed over, watch this. The Lord spoke to Joshua and said, take for yourselves. See, there are some things that we've got to start doing, saints of God. God gave them instructions, but they had to obey him. He said, take for yourselves. Everyone say, I'm doing this for me. Look at this now. He says, take for yourselves the, tw the 12 men chosen from among the people, one man from each tribe, and command them, pick up for, uh, for yourselves 12 stones, one each from, from, from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet are standing firm. Listen to what God says now. He says, what I want you to do, is where the people, where the waters were divided and the people crossed by on dry ground. I want you to send back representatives now to go down into the river, into the Jordan now, where the waters are still divided, where the priest's feet are standing strong. And I want you to get a stone, get a big round stone out of there, and you're going to bring it back. You're going to use this as a memorial. Now listen now, God is saying to us today, that I want you to remember, you've got to remember in the midst of your situation, watch this, when God has shown up mightily for you, when God has parted the sea for you, when God has healed your body, when God has delivered you, when God has made a way out of no way, when God has opened a door that shouldn't have been opened, when God elevated you, when you didn't devote, you didn't deserve the elevation, when God saved you, when you know you should have been dead, he says, what I want you to do is get a stone from that moment, right? from that moment and you carry that with you that you might have something to remind you so that you will remember what God did for you watch this now because he tells them something special he tells them from the place where the priest's feet are standing firm carry them over with you 
So you got to take this with you. Watch this. And lay them down at the place where you will spend the night tonight. Sometimes, saints of God, you've got to get that memory of when God brought you through back then. You've got to grab a hold of something and make that a memorial. You've got to hold on to that. You've got to keep that testimony nearby you. Hallelujah. And it's real important because he says, so you can keep that with you. Watch this. Tonight, where you spend the night. Sometimes we're going to go through dark seasons. But you got that testimony that you got with you. And you say, yeah, 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 I remember. It's hard right now. I'm going to dry my tears. It's tough right now. Yeah, they left me. Yeah, they didn't depend on me. But I, I, I remember that, that God brought me, he brought me through the last time. God brought me through the last time. God helped me the last time. God kicked the door open the last time. God picked me up the last time. Same God back then, same God right now. Hallelujah. Because in the night season, that's when we stop focusing. We get in trouble. We stop focused for whatever reason. When we're going through difficulty and going through pain, we're like Peter walking on the water with Jesus. We start looking around at all the stuff that's going wrong. When the Lord says, keep your eye on me. What are you doing? You are confidently trusting and leaning on the Lord. He says, take that, take, take that testimony as a memorial now. You've got to keep it. But it's up to you to get it. I don't care. Listen, we celebrate the smallest victories. If I just had a headache and I prayed and asked God, I prayed and declared my headache be healed and that thing went away, I say, Father, thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then I put it in perspective. We consider a headache to be a small thing. But you know, to God, all things are small. So it wouldn't matter if it was a headache or if it was cancer. It's still the same thing. Hallelujah. We got to change the way we look at things. Glory to God. Watch him now. He says, carry them over with you and lay them down at the place where you will spend the night tonight. Look at verse 6. So that this may be a sign among you. See, your testimony is a sign among you. It's another God sign that God is with you. That God is with you. And I know that some of you are saying, well, pastor, you know what? I, you know, I don't have a lot. Of, I don't, I, you know, I'm a new Christian, so I don't have a long history of experiencing miracles and signs with God. <clears throat> That's all right. You can take Abraham's testimony. <clears throat> You can take Moses' testimony. You can take Joshua's testimony. You can take Elijah's testimony. You can take Elijah's testimony. Hallelujah. You can take Ruth's testimony. Come on, somebody. You can take Solomon's testimony. You can take Peter's testimony. You can take Paul's testimony. You can take your neighbor's testimony. Hallelujah. Your neighbor tell you God brought me through. Hallelujah. God delivered me. God raised me up. The word tells me God is not a respecter of person. That in principle, what he does for one, he must do for another. Hallelujah. He says in verse 6, so that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask later, what do these stones mean to you? You see, it's all about what it means to you, what God did for you. What does it mean to you? Is it a big deal, girl? Listen, I prayed, God, I declared my headache to go. That thing, which is really... Oh, man, your headache went away? It went away. I'm t see, see, if it's a big deal to you, it'll become a big deal to them. I'm telling you, my headache is gone in Jesus' name. God is so good. Look at the power. Oh, go right there. There it is. Hey, hey, the glory of God, that headache is gone. Hallelujah. They asked them, what does it mean to you? See, what God does, it always matter. It always matter what it means to you. Jesus said to the disciples, he says, who do men say that I am? They say, they say that you are Elisha. They say, you are Elijah. You, you say you are one of the prophets. He says, yeah, 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 yeah. But who do you say that I am? You see, it always matters to God what you think about God. Human beings are different. We get caught up because we're always concerned about what everybody else thinks. 
We want to know what everybody else think about us, what everybody else think about what we did, what everybody else think about what we said, what everybody else think about what we got on. Look at here, I didn't dress for you, I dressed for me. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm telling you that God is great. We get so concerned. Well, they don't believe in God, so I believe in him. Yeah. Hallelujah. And if you just keep walking, they will start believing in him too because they will sit back and they'll have to say, goodness gracious, everywhere they go, there's a God sign. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Watch what he say. Then you shall say to them, that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial for, you, for, uh, for Israel forever. He says this thing is supposed to be forever. That testimony you have should last forever. If you tell enough people your testimony will keep going. It'll keep going. Everybody say, oh, yeah, I remember when Big Mama did this and, and Big Mama's gone on to be with the Lord. I remember when, when, when Granddaddy did this and so on and so forth. Do you know Granddaddy did this and this miracle happened and such, 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 and such? You're talking to your kids. Hallelujah. Yeah, your testimony should live forever. Verse 20. And those 12 stones which they had taken from the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal. He said to the sons of Israel, when your children are asking their fathers in the time to come, what do these stones mean? Oh man, there's an incredible revelation right there. We're going to begin to talk about family saints of God over the next couple of weeks as we wrap up this series on the Holy Spirit. But I want you to understand the Bible says, he said, here Joshua says that he's going to say to the sons that when your sons ask you, he's going to say to the children of Israel, when your sons ask you, when your children ask their fathers, Fathers, that means that we have to be adept and equipped and ready. Hallelujah. It's not the mother's job to take the children to church. It's your job. It's not the mother's job, hallelujah, to lead the children in the ways of God. It's your job. We are the priest of the house. It is our job to train and rear the child in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Men should be testifying to their children of the goodness and the power and the strength of God, the love of God, the forgiveness of God, the manifold grace of God. <laughs> Women, it's incredibly important that if your relationship broke out, broke up and things didn't turn out well, that you do not use children as weapons. You don't hold the children back from seeing their father. Hallelujah. Children need their fathers. Glory to God. You've got to create an environment. It's not about you, it's about the child. Hallelujah. You allow the children to see their fathers. Hallelujah. Unless, unless now, unless it's a toxic situation. If it's a toxic, we're not talking about that. We're talking about under normal circumstances. It is your responsibility to, well, I ain't going, I ain't going. No, you need to. You're hurting no one. Do you know that when children grow up with them, first of all, okay, okay, go over to God. I'm getting on my soapbox. I'm going to save this for the Family Life series. Go over to God. We'll be in it next month. Don't you tell your neighbor. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Bring all your family members and friends. We're going to dig deep into heavy relationship. We're going to talk about the elephants in the room. We're going to talk about the dysfunctionality of family and relationship and how the generational curses continue to leap from generation to generation. Demonic spirits of brokenness, demonic spirits of divorce, demonic spirits of hurt, how they keep leaping from generation to generation. Glory to God. The fathers, the fathers, fathers, men, you've got to be equipped. You spend time with God and then you can tell them, this is how you pray. This is how you trust God. This is how you have confidence in God. This is what you do. And you don't allow your children to stay home. You bring them to church. When you get up, they get up. Hallelujah. Watch this now. It says, and when your children ask their fathers in the time to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know Israel crossed this Jordan on dry ground. You'll start telling them about the miracles God performed. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you, for you until you crossed over, just as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed, so that all the people of the earth may know without any doubt. You see, your testimony, saints of God, the miracles that God is performing in your life 
is going to cause all the people of the earth to believe and not doubt. See, you got to release God to work miracles in your life. Listen to me carefully. God wants to. And so, no, no, no. I don't know what other church, I don't know how you, 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 you were brought into Christianity before you got to CLC, but I got revelation for you. God wants to. Amen. You do not have to beg God. Amen. Yeah, 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 yeah. You don't have to beg God once. Listen, the Bible says if you being evil know how to give your children good gifts, how much more so your Father in heaven? Amen. Glory to God. No, God wants to do miraculous things for you. And he doesn't ask you, is it your fault? Are you the cause of it? God never says that. What he says is, do you believe that I can do this for you? That's what he says. Do you believe in me? Do you have confidence in me? Come on, somebody. This reverential fear of God leads us to a place where we begin to call on him, where we honor God, where we obey God where we honor God with everything we have, our tithe and our offering, our substance. Hallelujah. Where we bring that before God as a worship. We honor God with our time. We honor God with our service. We honor God with our submission. God, how can I serve you? How can I serve others? How can I help you advance your kingdom agenda? How can I get involved in your earthly ministry? When we reverence God, the spirit of the fear of the Lord, causes us to want to obey him. I want to honor God. And it causes us to despise the displeasure of God's heart. I don't want to hurt him. I don't want to hurt God's heart. Hallelujah. Verse 24. So that all the people of the earth may know without any doubt and knowledge that the hand of the Lord is mighty and extraordinarily powerful so that you will fear the Lord your God and obey and worship him with profound awe and reverence forever. Come on, musicians, I'm done. God is calling us. Come on, give him a great big God bless you. As we reverence God this way, God is going to begin to do miraculous things in your life. Hear me carefully, and I want you to receive this. God signs are going to begin to pop up all around you. In your home, listen, in the life of your children, listen to me carefully, on your job, in your automobile, in your social circles, everyone say God signs. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to close with Proverbs 22 and 4 in the Amplified Bible. Because the fear of the Lord has tremendous benefits, saints of God. Tremendous benefits. The Bible says the reward of humility, that is having a realistic view of one's importance. And the reverent, worshipful fear of the Lord, this is the reward. Riches, honor, and life. The Bible says that the reward is riches, honor, and life. That when I reverently fear God this way, I receive riches, honor, and life. Are you expecting anything other than a goosebump? When we reverently fear God this way, God says amazing things are going to start happening in your life. Increase is coming your way. Elevation is coming your way. And long life is coming your way. Hallelujah. And see, when life presents something different than that, you've got to start rebuking that thing. No, this is not what God promised me. I do not receive this in Jesus' name. Come on, give God a great big God bless you.